So, Peter, you've just written about a new class of submarines that the Chinese government is developing. Now, many listeners like myself probably don't know much about submarines or how any of them, no matter what kind, might impact those of us on the ground, living in the suburbs, very far away from any Navy fleet. So can you tell me about this new type of submarine? What's so new about them and why do they matter? Well, I don't know much about submarines either, Samantha, so don't worry. But I have talked to experts and so I'll do my best to distill the essence of what's going on. Why do they matter? They're essentially the most important tool of coercion that countries use against each other. That's, that's the essence of it. Broadly, as far as I understand, there are two main types of subs. There are attack subs, which are about chasing other submarines and other, and other naval assets. And then there are the boomers. They're the ones that carry the nuclear warheads. Now, to be completely clear, Australia doesn't have and isn't seeking to have uh, nuclear-armed submarines or nuclear arms of any sort. But we are allied to a country uh, and we shelter under the nuclear umbrella of that country that does have them uh, and uses them to establish uh, a coercive power which protects the US itself but also its allies. It's called extended nuclear deterrence is the name of the doctrine under which we've been sheltering for the last 70 years. Now. those boomers are essentially, so that's, that's nuclear-powered submarines, but critically nuclear-armed submarines. They are super important because um, they're designed to guarantee the survivability of a nuclear threat if there's a nuclear attack. So uh, let me just go back one step. The US has, and Russia during the Cold War developed, and now China is seeking to establish a so-called nuclear triad. That means that you've got uh, nuclear missiles deployed in all three of the main domains. So you've got nuclear armed uh, missiles on, the, on land, usually in silos, or sometimes carted around on a, a portable uh, launcher like the North Koreans do. You've got um, uh, subs in the water and in the air. In, on bombers, and that on all three of those are continuously available for firing for use in the event of a nuclear war. The idea is that because land missiles and airborne uh, missiles are relatively easy to destroy by an enemy, especially if it's planning a first strike, that you have submarines as the survivable, the most survivable leg of that triad mm. because uh, they're underwater. They're hard to find, they're stealthy, and the uh, nuclear-powered ones can stay underwater effectively, indefinitely, limited not by power supply but only by the fatigue of the crew and the need for food. They can even make their own water and oxygen. Wow. So the idea is that if during the Cold War, if the Russians were to attack uh, uh, the US preemptively, knock out most of its nuclear capability, you would still have the boomers underwater able to deliver nuclear destruction to the Soviets, and that is the deterrence against a first strike. The Russians have the same same capability, and what is now happening, and the importance of what we're discussing today, is that China has never had that capability. They've got nuclear-armed submarines, they've got nuclear-powered submarines, but theirs are not uh, quiet enough uh, and potent enough to really be a credible... Uh, deterrent to a U.S. first strike. And the Chinese want uh, parity with the Americans and the Russians, and they're on the brink of getting it. And notably, you've also written that these this new generation of submarines that the Chinese are developing, also the missiles would have a much greater reach. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the submarines themselves, the Type 96, as they're called, um, are, are a, more, a much more serious uh, weapon of war because they are apparently, now none of them are in the water yet, uh, but from what we know of technical studies, analysis, intelligence, expert guesswork, the submarines themselves are apparently a lot quieter and therefore more stealthy and more survivable. But the, the missiles they carry, as you mentioned, um, we know about them because they've already been test fired and they have a range of nine to 10,000 kilometers, which would mean that the uh, Chinese fleet would be able to fire those potentially nuclear-armed, nuclear-tipped missiles from Chinese territorial waters and strike, uh, well, not only all the U.S. bases in the Indo-Pacific, but the continental U.S. 
itself potentially. So that's that would be a more potent weapon on a more potent submarine. And so put those together, and that is why the Type 96 is uh, a, a threshold in the development of uh, the, the, the ability of the powers, the great powers, to coerce each other and to deter each other. I mean, that's all very interesting. And I was just wondering if you could help contextualise it a bit sure. to, I guess, answer, do these new subs smack of a Cold War-like development? Absolutely they do. Um, absolutely. Uh, because the, um, the dreadful threat of the Cold War was nuclear Armageddon. And the great safeguard against nuclear Armageddon was, was parity, was the fact that it was mutually assured destruction between the Soviets and the Americans. And what the Chinese are now trying to achieve is the same thing, is that entering this new phase of competition of uh, adversarial foreign policy and strategic policy, that the Chinese also will have the same parity to protect themselves against any first strike, not that the American doctrine calls for first strike, but it would give the Chinese um, the assurance that they wouldn't be subject um, to, or that they, they would have a survivable nuclear capacity if the Americans were to attack them first, or the Russians for that matter, um, although that's less likely now that they're best buddies. But the, um, uh, so, so that's the concept, is to develop mutually assured destruction for the new Cold War and hope that it works because um, a Cold War is better than a hot war between two superpowers. Right. And I, I did want to ask you a bit further about the numbers of subs we're talking about, because we know the US, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, China and India, they all have nuclear subs. Yeah. Um, the US currently has 14 nuclear armed subs. China only has six nuclear subs currently, and they're looking to add eight of these new generation mm. subs, which would be potentially nuclear armed as well. That's right. So they'd each have 14. So why is that such a threat? I mean, they're not going to have more than the US. Uh, what it does is it changes um, the balance of power between those countries, uh, and it means that um, the U.S. alone is possibly going to struggle. Well, in fact, look, we don't need to speculate about this. The Americans have told us this, and uh, a senior White House official, Kurt Campbell, Indo-Pacific coordinator for the Biden administration, has told me on the record, uh, quote, we can't do it alone anymore. The uh, Chinese uh, power and military, economic, technological power, according to the US, is now too great for the US to manage by itself. And it's drawing on its allies' capabilities to help. So the Type 96, it's not just that there would be a similar number, although the Americans are now going to be producing more boomers if they get the funding uh, um, through the Congress. So it is... It, it is a competition between the US and China, no question. Uh, but it's not just the, the, the numbers, it's also the quality. So uh, at the moment, uh, whenever a Chinese submarine leaves port, an American nuclear submarine, nuclear powered submarine, because they're very stealthy, slips in behind it and follows it for as long as it's at sea. That's what happens. Mm. And because in the event that there's a war, the first thing that those subs would do would be to sink the Chinese submarines. And what the Chinese seek is the ability to return the favor. So that's what that's all about. Now, if the Chinese, if the Type 96 are as quiet as they're supposed to, to be when they do eventually launch, um, then the Americans might not have that capability anymore. Uh, so the, what, what we saw last Saturday was an announcement from the three governments that comprise the AUKUS deal. That's the US, the UK, and Australia to pool their underwater detection capabilities for the first time. Uh, and that means a bunch of different types of uh, technology. So there's uh, sonar boys, you know, floating things that mm. uh, have sonar detection capabilities. But also the US has a network of undersea sensors that they started laying on the floor of the ocean in the 1950s. Mm. Chinese are laying their own and so on and so on. Uh, and the Americans are, are apparently seeking to lay a new generation of sensors on the ocean floor, but this is all highly secret stuff. Yeah. We're, we're trading here on scraps of information and intelligence, but, uh, but there are also other methods. So the, the three AUKUS uh, defense ministers said on Saturday that they're also going to be deploying new, um, essentially drones, underwater drones, that the submarines of the three countries will fire out of their torpedo tubes, drones that will, will go underwater, wander around in the ocean, uh, 
with with sonar and sound sensors highly sensitive and that all the information from all these types of sensors will be uh, transmitted uh, to uh, the, the Poseidon aircraft, for example, the electronic, is it the electronic brains and detection center, if you like, that in Australia flies uh, a number of those, but so does the US and UK, and that these would all be used, they would be networked together to look more closely for signs of Chinese submarines in anticipation of a stealthier generation, the Type 96. And this is what it's all about, uh, tr trying to keep an edge on the Chinese fleet uh, with the nuclear, uh, with, the, with their evolving nuclear capability. Okay, so Peter, this brings me to a question I wanted to ask you about where this all started. I guess the obvious question is, is Australia somewhat responsible for starting an arms race with China? We know that the Chinese government did not fondly receive the news in 2021 that Australia had entered into the AUKUS Pact with the US and the UK, which is going to provide us with our first nuclear-powered submarine. So is this China's response? Um, superficially, it might look like it because in Australia, we've heard essentially zero about the Type 96, but we have heard a lot about AUKUS. So it might appear that that's what's going on. And there is a school of thought uh, headed by one PJ Keating which says that essentially uh, anything that we do will provoke the Chinese government and therefore we should do nothing. Uh, but that is completely wrong and the chronology is completely wrong because the Type 96, the planning for it uh, was first reported a decade ago. Uh, 2013, there were already reports of an imminent, the imminent development of the, this new generation of Chinese submarine. Uh, whereas, of course, AUKUS was only conceived two years ago. So it's actually the other way around. If there is an arms race, uh, it's Australia and its allies catching up through the AUKUS sub with what the Chinese uh, announced they'd be doing, or at least uh, started planning doing a decade ago. Okay, and this brings me to something that you wrote about, which is that, according to your column just the other day, there's been zero debate about this new generation of submarines mm. that China's developing. So if the potential impact of these new subs is so profound, as you've written, then why has there been zero debate about them in Australia? I mean, does it suggest an intelligence failure, laziness, naivete? It, it is a baffling question. I, I wondered about it myself. So um, it, it's not an intelligence failure because the intelligence services and the government knows all about um, the Chinese fleet and the Type 96 and all of that. It's just that the media hasn't reported. Uh, now, international media, there's been lots of reporting and analysis of them. Uh, Australia, it's, it, it is peculiar because submarine warfare has become such a big debate topic, such a hot topic in mm. Australia in the last two years. And yet, we seem to be having it in this complete isolated vacuum without any reference to what our adversary is doing or planning. It's kind of bizarre. So I got the library to do a careful search and they looked at uh, LexisNexis, Factiva, our own archives and the web uh, combined collectively were able to find uh, only one reference in any Australian media report to the existence of the Type 96, just one. As for why that's so, all I can suggest is first a broad insularity in the way that we, Australia, the Australian media looks at the world we generally don't do a great job of reporting on the wider world, um, unless it's the US, which we essentially, we import a lot of uh, free and very cheap media coverage from the US syndicated. And we, we seem to get a lot of coverage of the US, but uh, much less so of other countries, particularly China. That's not entirely our fault. Uh, for example, the Sydney Morning Herald and Age have had correspondence in Beijing from the 1970s, the moment that, were, that we were allowed to put journalists into Beijing, we had them there. Mm. But they've been, uh, almost all Western journalists have been harassed uh, out of China in recent years or simply banned and not issued visas. A couple have been allowed, a few have been allowed back in in the last year or two. Uh, maybe that will change, but until now, there are no Australian journalists allowed in, into Chinese territory. So it's difficult to report sensibly, accurately and uh, you know, um, regularly mm. uh, when we're not allowed in. So th th there are a couple of explanations, but it's still, it's still kind of extraordinary that 
such a crucial development which would so change the balance of power and the alliance structure of which we are part has been just a, a, a great silence in our system. And finally, I was p- partly because of that, I was provoked into writing that column. Right. And I wanted to ask you, does this perhaps lack of debate over the subs make Australia look a bit inept? Because your article comes at a very sensitive time. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong just met with her French counterpart and they announced expanded cooperation, a joint think tank, plus the news that Australian Navy ships are set to gain greater access to French military bases in the Pacific. And this is obviously a major step forward after the rupture that occurred in 2021 when Prime Minister Scott Morrison famously cancelled a submarine contract with the French. So could news that the AUKA subs might be slightly out of date make us look bad? (laughs) Well, uh, Australia has, in terms of its defence capability, in terms of its submarine capability, we've looked pretty bad for a long time. Uh, We kept signing contracts for new submarines, uh, deluding ourselves that it was all going to happen, and then they all failed or were cancelled. And billions of dollars go out the door in planning and diplomatic investment in those relationships with the Japanese and the French, and nothing comes of it. It's utterly incompetent and completely unimpressive on any measure to any of us as well, you know, much as any other country. What is happening now is the French, the Australians, but also uh, the Americans, the Brits, the Japanese, Uh, the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, right across the board, the Europeans um, are now getting to the long run strategic serious question of how they are going to match and manage the Chinese and potentially Chinese and Russian allied uh, capabilities and intentions. And those capabilities are growing and they're all grappling with the same problem. And it's a reflection of the same mentality that's uh, encased in the AUKUS deal, which is worried governments getting together Mm. to try to balance their power against what appears to be an ever enlarging and overweening power that the Chinese are developing. That's essentially what this is all about. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Uh, It's a slightly terrifying and uh, a prospect and yet uh, an important responsibility and happy to share it with you.